Hello, everyone. Flight okay. Weather fine. Lovely scenery. Lots of food and drink. See you soon. Right. I think this has had long enough in the sun. It's gone all red. Actually, I'm booked in for two weeks rock climbing, but tonight we shall come face to face with a real jet setter. Excuse me, lads. She's someone whose job is literally to bring sunshine into our lives. And here's one very satisfied customer. Hi, Michael. Listen, I'm really glad that you're on the trail of this very special lady. She does deserve the attention of the Big Red Book. And I know she likes surprises because I actually caught her out myself earlier this year. Anyway, all the best, and I'll join you later, if all goes to plan, that is. See you later. Thank you, Cliff, for the moment. Now, whatever he says, there is one group who do not sing her praises, and that is the nation's villains. When she's not out chasing the sun, she's helping the police chase them. These days, she's the picture of health and vitality, but it wasn't always the case. When she was a tiny girl, her parents were warned that she might not survive. And at the age of three, she underwent pioneering heart surgery. After that, everything was different. Today, she's not on a sun-drenched beach or a copper's beat. She's actually in a recording studio putting the finishing touches to one of her shows. I've recorded a special holiday video for her. I'm sure she loves home movies. Jill, I wouldn't mind just having a quick look at the uh, top of the show again. Would you just have a look at mm. what you think? Have a look around and a listen, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Oh, what's Michael? What's Michael Aspel doing there? Hello, Jill. Fancy seeing you here. Funny who you bump into just when you think you've got away from everything. What's this? <laughs> yes. No! <laughs> don't cry, Jill. No, I don't believe this. I've just brought you a little souvenir from my travels. A little <laughs> album called Jill Dando. This is your life. <laughs> hey! I just saw you coming up there. And I thought, <laughs> you're not in tonight's programme. No, I get in everywhere. <gasps> We've got a lovely five-star studio, dinner included, uh, <laughs> to do the show. So, it's get your breath back time. Gosh, thank you. And come with me. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Funny thing is, Jill, you and I met two days ago and you wanted to talk about This Is Your Life. Yes, I know. It was just so funny. No. I can't believe this and I had no idea. Well, that's the plan. <laughs> you kept it quiet. <laughs> well, the deck chairs have been Gosh. taken in for the night here, but hopefully relaxed. Your family plus friends and assorted colleagues, not least the man in your life, Bob Wheaton. Now, Bob, you run the BBC's International News Channel and you have a hectic lifestyle of your own, so it must be a rare chance to sit together just by yourselves yes. with no one else around. Does it happen? Thank you for the opportunity. You painted the picture of an extraordinarily prolific uh, presenter, uh, but we hardly ever see each other. Our jumbo jets uh, pass in the night, and we go into studios, we go to parties, and thank you for bringing us together anyway on this. this occasion. All that must play havoc with the digestion. But there was one assignment, <laughs> Jill, that you wouldn't have missed for the world, a chance to meet your childhood idol, and he remembers it well. Hi again, Michael, and hi, Jill. I am delighted that Michael has caught you out. Of all the people tonight that have spoken about you and will be speaking about you, I suppose I'm the one that knows you the least. I've known you the least amount of time, that is. But over that period of time, like everybody else, I have come to realise that you are a gorgeous, wonderful TV personality and, above all, a fantastically kind human being. When I surprised you earlier in the year, it was at the Vienna Royal Opera Ball. You were expected to be waltzed off your feet by some Habsburg prince I came here unescorted, but I'm told that a prince is waiting in the wings. His name is Markham Salvatore von Habsburg Lodringen. It's not! It's not! It's not! <laughs> Jill, I'm so sorry about this. I mean, poor Prince Marcus, he had no chance. I nobbled him. I, t I let his tyres down so I could get here. I have my knight in shining armor.
you actually look pleased to see me. You're a wonderful actress, and I thank you for that moment. It's <laughs> one of the best nights of my life. So anyway, oh, may I remind you, you did promise me at that time that you'd be happy to play tennis with me in Birmingham next month, so I'll see you then. Have a wonderful evening. God bless always. Thank you, Claude. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Oh. But Jill, he's not the only man to remember your fancy footwork. Well, it left me lost for words. Hard to believe. It's Eamon Holmes. <laughs> Tell us about the day you were bereft of speech. Well, everyone knows Jill as the consummate professional, which she is on screen. And she's also very caring and very helpful. And we worked together on Breakfast News for a couple of years. And I did the sports desk. Mm -hmm. And one day I had particular trouble with Goran Ivanisevic, tennis player, <laughs> as you would, which is said completely differently than the way it's spelled and it has to be said. So I was reading this and Jill's idea of taking my mind off this was to take her shoe off with her left foot and play footsie with me under, <laughs> under, the, under the table with this. Now I don't know how I said <laughs> Goran Ivanisevic that day, but it certainly was very highly pitched, I know that. <laughs> you were safe over that? there and we'll find out later. Yeah. Well, Jill, Wendy, Dando, this oh, is your yes, life, thank you. and it started... <laughs> Does that embarrass you? I'm sorry. A little, a little. Well, Jill, Wendy, Dando, this is your <laughs> life, and it started on November the 9th, 1961, at Ashcombe House Maternity Home in Western Supermare. Mm. You were certainly a bouncing baby at nine pounds, and you were the second child of Jack and Jean Dando. There you are, in your late mother's arms, <laughs> with your dad and your brother Nigel. Jill, you're the apple of your mother's eye. It is your father, Jack, and your brother, Nigel. Aww. Now, Jack, Jean was delighted to have a daughter. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we were very thrilled when Jill came along. Very but, thrilled. But you soon had reason to be worried. Oh, yes. When, uh, just about when she started to walk, we noticed how her cheeks were very red. And if she tried to run across the room, she was out of breath. So, of course, we knew there was something wrong. Well, Nigel, you're nine years older than your sister, and you remember your parents' concern. Yes, it was a very worrying time, really, because nobody seemed to know what was wrong with her. Uh, she went to the clinic, and uh, they suggested it might be a heart murmur, and then on to Western Hospital, where it was suggested that she might have a potentially fatal heart condition. Well, at that time, treatment of such conditions, particularly in children, was still being developed, but you were lucky. You were in the care of one of the country's leading experts, and 30 years on, she is here, Dr. Beryl Corner. God. Oh Bill, what was your diagnosis? I realised at once that you had a serious condition of your heart. You were a blue baby. And that unless something was done, you would not live very long. So I transferred you to Bristol Children's Hospital, where we had the necessary tests and x-rays done. And these showed that you had a hole in the heart and a blockage of the main artery to the lungs, the pulmonary artery. I referred you to Mr. Belsey, at Bristol Royal Hospital, where the operation was done. Yes, and you saved my life. Thank you. Gosh. Even so, it was a very tricky business. You were admitted to the cardiac unit on January the 12th, 1965. Aged just three, you faced eight hours of crucial surgery. And in those days, all open-heart surgery was largely experimental. Yes, the surgeon who performed that pioneering operation himself has recently undergone hip surgery, but he insisted on being here, Ronald Belsey. A long time. Oh. <laughs> I've always wanted this moment to say thank well, you. How are you, dear? Very well, thank You're you. You're a credit to the old firm. Thank you very much. This was, this was groundbreaking work, wasn't it? Yes. <clears throat> we attached her to a heart-lung machine with a heat exchanger. I then cooled her down to 14 degrees, the coldest she's ever been in her life. She was then in a state of suspended animation. Well, I opened her heart and I corrected all the abnormalities. The cooling and heating has to be done very, very slowly. 
The other disadvantage is the surgeon's hands get damn cold while he's operating. <laughs> but uh, we closed the heart, warmed her up, and she came back to life. Yes. And I gather she's been warm-hearted ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thanks much, Mr. Belsey. <laughs> Thank oh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jack, January the 31st, 1965, was a day to remember. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we were informed that uh, Joe was ready to come out of hospital. Joe, with the nurse, came walking out of the ward. And when she saw us, she ran to us. It was the proudest day of our life, I think, that was. <laughs> I'm pleased to say that I don't remember much about this. I think if I had, <laughs> I think I would have been far more traumatised. I feel sorry for my family who had to go through it all, really. And your wife died ten years ago? Yes. I'm afraid she died of leukaemia. Yeah. She would have obviously been proud oh, of Oh, she would have been, if been here today. It meant, well, it would have been absolutely marvellous. Yeah, terrible. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, Jill, with annual checkups, you were now able to live life to the full. You go to Greenwood Junior School and then Intermediate School. The future star of the newsroom showed an early rapport with the typewriter. You also managed to get in a bit of practice for another job. We're all going on a summer holiday. No more working for a week or two. Fun and laughter on a summer holiday. No more worries for me or you. Oh dear, no! <laughs> now, even in those days, there were people who knew you would go far. Yes, Jill, I was one of them. You were my star pupil. She taught you to read 30 years ago, Bette Jones. <laughs> Bet you give Jill 10 out of 10. I give her 20 out of 10. Well, you really were lovely, because every time I wanted something doing, you did it. Milk monitor. That's right. Milk yeah, monitor. it was milk monitor, I remember that. Reading yeah. in prayers. Yes. Giggling in between. Yes. All the time. <laughs> Nothing I told your mum you'd do great. Oh. I always told her that. Oh. She didn't believe me. No, no. But well. I'm so very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you lovely so much. You. Thank lovely you. start you gave me. You Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, oh, well. lovely to see you. Thank you. Oh. You went on to World Comprehensive and then to Broad Oak Sixth Form Centre where you became head girl. Nigel, after her A-levels, Jill followed in the family tradition. Yes, that's right. Uh, before I took up my present job with the Bristol Evening Post, I was a reporter on the Western Mercury weekly paper in uh, Western Supermare. Um, Dad was a head compositor there for 38 years and uh, Jill applied to the editor for a job to become one of the first female reporters on the Mercury. Well, you certainly made an impression. That editor who gave you your first job remembers working with all the dandos. We're going on a tour of the offices of the Mercury to meet, first of all, John Bailey. Hello, Jill. I recall that it was in 1980 you came to me for a job. And I took you on. And a great success you made of it. Jill, I'm very much looking forward to your next travel programme, which they tell me is about mountaineering in Holland. Congratulations, Jill, on what you've achieved. You deserve every bit of it. Hi, Jill. It was my job to keep you hard at work. Do you remember when I retired, you wrote to me recalling that if you were chatting in the office, I used to say, too much talking and not enough typing. But well, now you're paid to talk. <laughs> Before you arrived here, we all had to work on the women's page. It was certainly a relief to hand that one over. Well, things have moved on since then, of course, and today the Mercury has a woman editor. Stop the press! Told you. Don't worry, Jill, the paper's in safe hands, and I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking you for heading the Mercury's appeal to provide a hospice for Western Supermare. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh. Now, John Crockford Hawley, you were Weston's mayor when Jill was a cub reporter, and she also had an extra and very special responsibility. Yes, well, this, this is some 12 years ago now, and uh, 
it, it was a very busy year indeed, and, and on occasions the mayoress couldn't undertake her duties, and Jill deputised as, as, as an unofficial <laughs> mayoress, and a very grand one she was as, as well. <laughs> But you learned your trade during four years at the Mercury. You also found time to be a keen member of Western Dramatic Society. Mm -hmm. There you are in full costume. <laughs> now you also got some useful exposure and did some good work for Sunshine Radio at Western General oh Hospital gosh, yeah. and for talking newspapers for the blind. In 1985, you spot an advert for an assistant at BBC Radio Devon. And there, it was my lucky draw to work with you. The man whose days are numbered literally the voice of the National Lottery, Alan Dedicote. <laughs> You've actually achieved. I know. You've achieved what Terry Wogan failed to do. Was, You've revealed the voice of the ball. I know, I was just thinking that. Alan, what did you do? Well, I was the breakfast show presenter at uh, Radio Devon, and we very quickly realised that we had a very talented person on the team here, and uh, Jill joined us. Uh, the only thing was, I would say, that uh, whilst she may look a million dollars in somewhere like Bermuda on a beach, but at five o'clock in the morning, oh. coming into a Radio Devon studio yeah. in the middle of winter, yeah. well, it's you a can completely talk. different story. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But a lot of people in Devon, Jill, are very proud of what you've done. Oh, I'm very proud you. of one achievement of mine, actually. Yes. I got you into bed. You did? I did. You did? Oh, that's I did. Yes. Right. Don't worry, Bob. Don't worry, please. Don't worry at all. It was purely for publicity reasons, and that was it, yes. Yes, you must have thought your luck had changed. <laughs> Now your switch to television came in 1987 with a stint for ITV in Plymouth. Then you joined the local BBC's new show, Spotlight. An evening you'll never forget came when you and a co-presenter were having what you thought was a private conversation. Little did we know we were telling the world our secrets. True confessions from Juliet Morris. What was that? <laughs> Juliet, this sounds a bit uh, delicate. Uh, well, it's a little delicate, and I can't obviously go into detail, but do you remember that you and I had to put out a half-hour regional programme um, every Friday? Jill very kindly said she'd come in for a gossip um, on my <laughs> evening to do this. Microphone goes up, introduce the programme, that was fine. We start gossiping, as you do, and guess what we were gossiping about? Men. Men. Um, <laughs> and uh, a couple of minutes into this rather riveting conversation, the sound man comes in going, get it down! <laughs> and it was like we'd left the microphone up. And so all the viewers of the South West uh, were party our... to our conversation. Oh, gosh. And lots of Lucky them. Which and we've I'm had lots about. of good conversations since. We have. Well. Yeah, mostly about men, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a surprise. <laughs> Thank you, Julia, oh, very much. Julia. Bye. In the spring of 1988, the chance of national TV came your way. The BBC was looking for a newsreader for breakfast time. Now, Robin Walsh, you were the uh, managing director of Daily News programmes. Uh, Jill was reluctant to leave the West Country. Absolutely. On the one hand, we had people almost literally queuing up to get on um, network television, but not this very talented presenter who could not be weaned away for, from her beloved Plymouth. So I got on the phone and suggested to her that this sort of opportunity maybe happens once in a career. Mm. And if you don't take it, uh, you might well think thereafter of the what might have been. Yeah. So Jill said, OK, I'll come to London. And that was a very good decision. <laughs> yes. Well, the move to London was a terrific wrench. On your last day in the Plymouth studios, there were tearful farewells, yeah. an appropriate gift for the BBC's new early morning girl. <laughs> Greggy is here with some flowers. <laughs> I must just... How many flowers moment. have I done this now? Oh. I... Disappear from the set. Yes. Thank you very much. Ah, I had a, a little whip round for you, unfortunately, oh. an alarm clock. It's so early now, on breakfast time. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you get that hairstyle? You reported for duty with Breakfast Television in May 1988. Hungry for advice, you turned to a safe pair of hands. I only hope I was making sense at three in the morning. <laughs> Your breakfast teammate, Bob Wilson. Bobby! Yeah, I know. How are you doing? Bob? So, Jill look to you, did well, you? Well, she didn't need much advice, but we used to have these little tete-a-tetes around about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the we morning, did, something yes, like that. And honestly, it was just a case of 
telling her about the style and the personality and the most natural radio lady around. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, I miss being able to tell people that I spend half the night with Jill Dancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Oh, Bob. and a wonderful half a night it was, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was something you said, but another of your early breakfast colleagues now lives in Scotland, your good friend Sally Magnuson. Hi, Jill. Thought I'd better put in an appearance to expose to the world how you whipped my job off me all these years ago. <laughs> Remember? No, of course you don't. Complete fabrication. What actually happened, if you recall, was that I had been a presenter in Breakfast News for over oh, ages in between my many and various pregnancies. And you arrived on the scene, fresh young rookie from Bristol, I think it was, and you were immediately very, very good at it. But you were so terribly sweet because you kept thinking that somehow you, you might be, you know, threatening my position on the program. Well, to put you out of your misery, I sorted that one out straight away. I got pregnant. <laughs> yes, Jill, I did it for you. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. As you got slimmer and slimmer and more and more glamorous, I got fatter and fatter until eventually I couldn't even get behind the desk. Anyway, it's been a wonderful friendship ever since those days. Thank you for that, and have a great time tonight. Oh, thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. By 1989, you'd become a key part of BBC Breakfast News, and Bob, that's where you two met. We did. Well, we met slightly before that, but I'd uh, been on the 6 o'clock news in those days. In Jill's case one night in 1991, about two hours we'd been out, a rare evening, and there was a coup in the Soviet Union. And we walked in and said, anything happened? And they said, oh, there's been a coup in Moscow. And we said, don't be silly, and sat down and had the coffee. But there had been, and Jill was in the top chair, in the, in the, in the main chair, and she held that program together, breaking news for four hours in an admirable fashion. Well, this is how Britain woke up to that news. Good morning. The time is six o'clock. BBC Breakfast News is on the air early this morning to bring you dramatic news from Moscow. Mr. Gorbachev is no longer in charge of the Soviet Union. Justin Webb, now you were a beginner at breakfast television and Jill took you under her wing. She did indeed. I was very much the new boy when I arrived there. Jill was well established, but she couldn't have been kinder and more encouraging. But Jill, we'd already met some time before when I was a junior BBC reporter and I was passing through the newsroom and I was introduced to you, and I went and sat down and minded my own business in front of a computer screen. Imagine my surprise to get a message from you saying, what are we having for dinner? <laughs> Only then did it dawn on us both, I think, that I'd been sitting in Bob's chair and I'd got a message on his screen. <laughs> Should have said deviled kidneys. Now, in 1991, you get out from behind the desk and you go on a new assignment called Safari UK. And ever since... I see you in my bathroom every morning. Your partner on that show, award-winning TV journalist Julian Pettifer. Julian. Julian. I should explain, Michael, that the reason why Jill's in my bathroom is that we actually... <laughs> we, we actually... <laughs> We actually posed for a cover picture for the Radio Times for Safari UK. I've got it in my bathroom, and I understand you've got it in your hall. I is have. That, is that yes, right? yes. Now, there's one thing that you might not know about that picture. We actually, um, as you remember, we did it not out in the lovely English countryside where it ought to be done, <laughs> but we did it in some ghastly studio where they directed a plastic hedge. Do you yes, remember that yes, plastic hedge? Yes, yes. And we both had to put on solar topies and stick our... Stick our heads Stick our head straight. What you may not know is that somebody had actually um, gone behind the scenes and taken a picture of the um, famous backsides or the infamous backsides. Oh, no. How about that? Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> well, I had a wonderful partner and uh, well done, mentor. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Well, in 1992, it's time to hit the road again when you land another plum job. You pack your bags to present the BBC's holiday show.
she gets around, that girl, doesn't she? Yeah. Gets around. Well, you've certainly managed to get plenty of variety in your career. In 1995, you joined one of television's most dramatic and compelling programmes, Crime Watch. Your co-presenter was unavailable for interview tonight, but we have tracked him down. Here's his statement. Call Nick Ross. <laughs> Hi, Joe. When Sue Cook decided after more than a decade with Crime Watch that she'd had enough, she wanted to move on, we were aghast and we thought it was going to be very hard to fill her shoes. Except that with one accord, we all thought of you. And we just hoped you'd say yes. And we were pleased as punch when you did. You've been a great colleague. Stay with us for at least another decade to come. And have a great evening. Oh, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Now, all people in the public eye are asked to get involved with charity work. And in your own case, it's quite natural that you should choose the British Heart Foundation. Uh, Maxine Smith, uh, what does Jill do for you? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't realise that heart and circulatory disease is the UK's biggest killer. And Jill has been enormously helpful to us over recent years in promoting our cause and the work that we do. I'd particularly like to thank her for all the hard work she Relieved by a relative who invited you to share her home in Wimbledon. Today, she lives in a mountain village high in the Alps, and she's about to add to the Dando family numbers. But not before she has a word with you, your cousin, Judith oh, Dando. Jude. Hi, Jill. Well, I'm glad to get the chance to join you tonight. As you can see, I'm counting down the days now, but I thought it'd be nice to talk to you about our days together in London. Oh. I didn't realise when I suggested we live together that you're more accident prone than me, in fact, a walking danger zone. <laughs> I remember the day you went to hang out the washing and you fell in the garden pond. <laughs> well, it was you who drip dried that day. We had so many accidents, in fact, that we had to build a special clause into our house insurance. <laughs> well, we had a lot of fun together. And I hope you're enjoying yourself tonight. Aww. I wish I could be there. Yeah, I do too. Well, she Aww. is actually, because we have flown her from Turin, Judith Dando. <laughs> Judith, thank you both for joining us. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Oh, it's lovely to see you. Oh. Thank you very much. Jill Dando, oh. this is your life. <laughs> Hyacinth wants a new car. Richard just wants a quiet life. Comedy next tonight on BBC One, keeping up appearances.